months. Um, but, you know, I, so I'm just thinking on that little scale, you know, it's, you've got um, a lot of passion, a lot of energy, a lot of anger, things that want to be changed. And then it's like, how does someone access to move forward in a direction that really is going to allow the transformation and evolution of the system to a place that we'd all like to see it go? Yeah, um, I'm thinking about like the who the hell are we and about the 99 versus the 1% and some of the ideas coming up. And I think it speaks to, um, I mean, there's a very important idea about like the not to blame the victim and that like it's not the job of the oppressed to, you know, teach the oppressor. And I think that's important to keep in mind. But then what, what is our individual responsibility within those roles as the oppressor, as the oppressor? I don't have much hope that the 1% are going to do their job as the oppressor and really take responsibility for what it is that they're doing and change things. So I think that's a real big challenge. On the other hand, I think within the 99%, you have a lot of people who know that it's easier to blame those external forces and to just collude with the system and be like, well, I'm a victim. I was crapped on, and so it's all your fault. And now I'm just going to throw you in jail, and if I get rid of you, then my problems are going to go away. When really, I mean, you talk about the 99%, that's like, Homeland Security is part of the 99%, you know, yeah. like janitors and, and in the worst funky bathrooms the 99%. You got a really huge crowd of people there that are not necessarily all the same that are part of this 99%. And I think it's uh, important that, yeah, people understand how to take responsibility for where they're at and understand that so much of what we do is a choice. Why do you stop at a red light? Oh, because I have to. Why do you have to? Because I'll get a ticket. So it's your choice to stop at the red light because you don't want to get caught and get a ticket. But nothing is actually physically stopping you. I mean, maybe that was a poor example, but no, I'm just saying. No, that was <laughs> So like, everybody feels like, well, you have to stop at a red light. It's just what you have to do. And it's like, well, how is that? It's a light. You're the one with the foot on the gas pedal and the brake. You have to make that choice. And people don't want to take that responsibility for all the things that happen to them and how they can um, not participate, <coughs> just colluding in that system. So, so then when you've got, there are, you know, many people that are still in that place, you know, which is, that is what it is, and when you've got a lot of those people involved in a collective movement, what is the result? You know, so, um, so how do we uplift and inspire and it cause an expansion for people to start to say, you know what, I'm not going to choose to be the oppressed anymore. I'm not going to choose to be the victim. I am going to empower myself and start to take responsibility for what am I telling myself? What, you know, what am I thinking that's causing? This is the cause and the effect happens in the outside world. So we think things we focus on things that we're probably not totally aware that we're thinking mm -hmm. on. It's like subconscious, and then, and then we cause things to occur in our, you know, the effect is what's happening in our in our outer world. So if you keep um. having the same effect in the world, then how are you being in your inner being? How are you feeling? What are you focusing on? How are you talking to yourself? You know, are you talking to yourself in ways that? is going to keep you in the oppressed position or in the victim position, or are you going to step up into more self-responsibility? So hold on, we got Linda. No, I know, I'm so sorry. Linda, I got Linda well. Ballard. Yeah, Ballard. Uh -huh. um, and Nora. Nora. Sean Sean has a talk. Okay, Sean, Nora. So, all right, I'm just going to riff a little bit because I'm thinking of Soren Kierkegaard who was this brilliant spiritual existential philosopher and he talked founder about founder of existentialism huh? founder of existentialism <laughs> yeah uh, and he's really closest to my heart out of all of them and when he talks about kind of along these lines of self responsibility <laughs> he talks about what he describes as the lower particular when the individual is preoccupied with themselves and their own needs and their own gratification mm -hmm almost like an unconscious kind of way of being in the world where there's self-focus. And then the next level, he talks about kind of agape or brotherly love or this universal level of kind of consciousness where you have this consideration <coughs> for others. You see yourself in relationship. So 
I've got something in my throat. So, so for example, law. You know, we start to abide by laws. We think of the common good. We start to really organize society. You know, golden rule, all these things. But then he does this brilliant maneuver, which is where I want to go with this. Then he talks about the higher particular, where he says we go beyond those universal laws. He gives the example of Abraham uh, murdering his son, obviously against the law to murder your son. But he's saying, what is it that propels somebody to that higher particular? Because then you are in this realm that he kind of refers to as the night of faith, where you, and I call it like being connected to existential intelligence, whether you call it God, whether you, whatever your, you know, spiritual belief is, it's like being in a certain type of flow where it isn't even about self anymore, it's about being a vessel for service and guidance. So I think, you know, that, that so that's kind of where I want to take this, because I'm really appreciative that you're bringing this to the table. But that's where, you know, I think it gets very interesting, because now we're getting beyond this idea of the community and right and wrong and the 99 and the 1. It's like, how do we then... Get you know, beyond that to do the work we're here right. to do. Right, because it is almost like at the lower particular, particular it's inform. Universal, it's reform. And then the higher particular, it's transformed. Yeah. And this is yes. actually yes. where all yes. that came oh. from. It's like struggling with Kierkegaard oh. and the OB <laughs> movement, actually, for me. You know, you know yeah, I thanks. just really want to highlight what you said about, mm -hmm. you know, I know that when I am coming from a disempowered place, I am not of service. I am actually contributing to the chaos or the um, just just chaotic beingness as I empower myself to take responsibility for what I can for how I'm showing up and how I'm experiencing things in the world I'm empowered I have a choice and I recognize that choice it's so important I, I think I was 20 this is ridiculous I think I was about 24 or 25 when I actually realized I had a choice I mean 24 or 25 and I, all of a sudden I said that's the right age oh my god I have choice oh okay so, but and then that element of being of service right we get out of our own world like I was just reading um I just started reading the um the uh I can't even remember it right now but anyway um and they talk about how is is this level of being that we're living in just about how comfortable can we be you know it's, it's like i mean is that all this is about and yeah it's like where is that element of being of service how can i personally in this moment be best of service and and the only way the first way is to be empowered from here and then move into the world from this empowered place and i love that you're bringing up those two points. Is that kind of what you're, what he was speaking to? So that to it's some degree, but it's almost like getting beyond the self, right, all yeah. notions of right, self. Yeah. And it's almost Buddhist in some ways, or mystical. Because right. he's a very mystical, existential philosopher. So there's the sense of not even, you know, kind of thinking about yourself, your own power. It's almost like being guided. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and well, and, yeah, and you've got to be sorry. willing. Oh, I'd yeah. like to just um, interrupt for just a second because we have visitors. We have two and, visitors. Yeah, we have so. Helen from Wales. Hi. We have Raj Hi. from Iraq. Hi. They, just, Hi. they stopped by and we'll just give them a quick tour. I didn't want to interrupt, but I thought they had to see the dome. Oh, oh. Oh. Brilliant. I love listening to you and guys. Let's just, tell you, let's just tell our visitors what's actually happening here. So this is the Justice Dialogue. We come together to talk about issues of justice, uh, economic, uh, political, social, environmental. And here we're having a talk about responsibility, self-responsibility for collective responsibility. And we're trying to address the issue of how being responsible as an individual person affects the ability for a movement to be more successful because people are more collectively responsible for what they're doing. And an important point has been made um, about, let me see if I get this right, please tell me if I'm getting it right, the individual uh, I think Sarah made this point. The individual should be a source um, of choice and agency in the world. That they are ground of bringing things uh, to the world. And so I think Sarah and, and, and Laura, uh, uh, 
emphasize this is that we as individuals have to have to actually embrace that power we have to be a source yes. if the larger collective can truly be powerful. And then Linda was t um, bring, connecting this to um, existential philosophy, which in my view really captures something that's special about the modern world. Because what Kierkegaard was really talking, in my reading of him, is talking about is Abraham was responding to God, right. the source of morality and truth. And there's an absurdity there. Right. Because we as individuals, in dealing with that source, we're not really agents. We are receptive. But then at the same time, we can't get past the sense in which we're responsible. So even though we're dealing with a source, we are ourselves somehow a source. Mm. This is strange. I, I don't fully understand here. But it's a, leap by, <laughs> it's it's a leap by virtue of the absurd. Yes. So once we start yes. to get into the universal law, mm -hmm. we're lost if we're reading Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard talks about faith. Mm -hmm. Faith happens by virtue of a leap. The abstract the can bring. So bringing it back to this, <laughs> at some point, we have to really, like you were saying, accept our position as a source. Mm -hmm. And that might, in some senses, be absurd. Right. Yeah. But, um, right. But, but, so that's where we, and then now there's other people yeah. over yeah. here.